much for inviting me to come all the way down. It took me forever to get here today. The roads were completely crowded, but I'm delighted to be at the Academy and to see so many of you here. When we saw all those midshipmen heading over to the other, the other building, I thought, uh-oh. Um, so I'm very happy. I'm delighted also that we have so many of you that are interested in Northeast Asia, in Japan, in our relationships there. Um, before I went to the Council on Foreign Relations, I was an academic, and so I spent a lot of time teaching Japanese domestic politics. Uh, Japan's foreign policy as well as the international relations of Northeast Asia. Today I'm happy to talk about any of those things, so um, we can do that uh, during the Q&A. But today, since I'm more or less a Washington person at the moment and I'm kind of deeply into this thinking process about our policy towards Japan and the U.S.-Japan alliance, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what's going on in policy terms, what I see today, what, what's happened over the last year for the U.S.-Japan alliance in particular because we've had a rather bumpy ride. Japan has a new government. It's a historic transition in Japanese politics, but it has not been easy for our policy community in Washington to navigate those changes. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. Um, but I also thought it would be useful for us to talk about how the U.S. and Japan now have to reorganize themselves a little bit. Northeast Asia is a very different place. Um, I think the Japanese are now being tested in ways that they have not been tested in the past. So I think it's going to create some dilemmas for Tokyo because they're going to have to rethink some of the post-war constraints or restrictions that they've put on their own uh, diplomacy and in particular their security policy. So I think what I'd like to do is, is walk us back out from a, a, we'll look at the last year or so of U.S.-Japan interaction and then walk back out to talk about our short-term agenda in the next few months in the terms of policy opportunities, but also to talk broadly about Northeast Asia. Can I ask, first of all, how many of you have been to Northeast Asia? How many to Japan, specific? Japan? Oh, there you go. China? Korea? Hey. <laughs> all right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> South, I would think. Yeah. All right, then. That's great. So we've got a, a, a very informed audience. So if you need to, at any point along the way, though, and I start to sort of refer to things, and you don't know where I'm going, feel free to raise your hand, okay? Because um, it's important that this is a conversation we have together. All right, so I have um, just come back from Tokyo. I gave this big lecture at the American Center there, which is attached to the U.S. Embassy. And we had a, an, a big audience, mostly journalists, but we had a big audience of academics. And all they wanted to talk about was China. What do we do about China? And I had been to Tokyo a year and a half ago, and all they wanted to talk about was North Korea. And so the two events that organized people's thinking when they think about the alliance in Tokyo, right, the two events was first the North Korean nuclear tests, right, and the missile launches, right, uh, in 2009 and earlier. So North Korea focuses the mind for the, if you're sitting in Tokyo, almost as much as it focuses the mind if, if you're sitting in Seoul. Um, and now, of course, with the interaction over the Senkaku Islands, which is what we were trying to find on the Google map, it's kind of interesting, but the Chinese uh, fishing trawler, that ran into the Japanese Coast Guard did that in an area that is vaguely somewhere in here. And the Senkakus are so small you can't even see them on this map. But what you should understand that this is Okinawa. This is all Japanese territory here. And all the way up to this island, which you'll see is very close to Taipei, is Japanese. So the Senkakus are right down there. And the fisheries boats, Chinese fisheries boats, are in those waters in the hundreds. And there's a, clearly a territorial dispute between China and Japan. But that incident itself, the trawler running into the Coast Guard ship, the Japanese arrest of the, the fisheries captain, uh, was the first time ever uh, that Japan has taken that kind of action against a Chinese vessel. Obviously not a military vessel, but a fisheries vessel. So it has raised some pretty uh, interesting challenges for the Japanese as they try to negotiate with China. And we can talk a little bit more about that interaction. But anyway, so last year, North Korea was firing missiles. This year, the Chinese are, in a way, they're kind of testing the Japanese resolve in terms of how they can defend their southern waters. But let me talk a little bit about the US and Japan before we get there. We've had a tough year in between uh, the, missile, the missile test last spring and the Senkaku incident. Um, and that's mostly because last August, the government of Japan changed in a resounding victory last August. Uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, the current government of Japan, won 308 seats in a 480-seat parliament, the highest number of seats in any post-war Japanese lower house election. So they not only won, but they won big. 
Um, and so what this did for them is they brought in you know, this, this massive excitement about change. Sounds a little familiar. Um, but this was the first time that the Japanese political system had transitioned in over half a century. So you had the, the conservative party, the liberal democrats, in power in Japan for almost half a century, either in coalition with another smaller party or they had an outright majority. So all of a sudden last year you have this new party coming into power. It does not have a foreign policy. It did not have in its manifesto, in its campaign uh, document, it didn't have any clear indication of whether it would be very different from the previous government on foreign policy issues. The one thing they did telegraph quite clearly, though, is that they had difficulty with the U.S. military presence in Japan. So if you looked at that document last summer when the campaign was heating up, if you'd listened to the DPJ politicians in the years leading up to this electoral victory last summer, you would understand that they had a problem both with the realignment of U.S. forces in Okinawa, which is as I said, right down here. They had a problem with the Status of Forces Agreement. How many of you know what a Status of Forces Agreement is? Yeah? Okay, sorry. I, I kind of assume because you're wearing a uniform that you do. But the Status of Forces Agreement is the political document that outlines the responsibilities of the host government and the responsibilities of the U.S. government in managing the U.S. forces when you're deployed abroad. Right? So a Status of Forces Agreement exists in any place where U.S. forces are forward deployed. So they didn't like the Status of Forces Agreement. They didn't like the money that the Japanese government spends to maintain forces on the ground. So clearly they had some difficulties with the way in which the alliance had been managed, and in particular the U.S. military presence in Japan. They also came into power, I think, expecting that they would have a lot of time to talk to the United States about a lot of these issues. And again, they were new to power. Um, but our policy team was on board. It was ready. It wanted an agenda. It wanted to revamp the alliance. It said, okay, let's review it. Let's move. Let's, let's get these things taken care of. And they were ill-prepared to, to move quickly. So a lot of the frustration over the last year or so has been the difference between Washington and Tokyo's expectations about how to solve these problems, but also how quickly you could try to address this agenda. Now this year, 2010, is the 50th anniversary of the treaty the bilateral U.S.-Japan treaty that commits the United States to help assist in Japan's defense. And it also is the legal basis for having a U.S. forward deployed presence in Japan. So that treaty is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. So the expectation of our policy community was that last year the president would visit, which he did in November, and the two governments would spend the year talking about a future-oriented security agenda, how to think forward in, in terms of what the U.S. and Japan could do together in the security realm. And then when the president went back, which he's going to do next month, um, he would, with the prime minister, celebrate the 50th anniversary of the treaty and make a great statement, a security declaration, announcing strategic objectives for the future, and the alliance would be reinvigorated. It's not going to happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. That image was certainly there. Um, but the, the politics in Tokyo kind of got in the way. And so what you find now today is a U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship that's trying to get back to a kind of normal consultative alliance um, relationship where people talk to each other, people sort out the problems, and this agenda setting uh, task now is still going to be in the future. But this is a relationship that those of us who sit in the think tank world in Washington um, we talk an awful lot about what that agenda ought to look like. And I will tell you a little bit about what I think it ought to look like. Um, so we had a, a historic election, a change in government, a very highly publicized disconnect, right? Specifically on the base, oops, it disappeared. On the base, it's okay. On the base issues, right? Specifically in Okinawa, which again we can talk about. But a disconnect between Washington and Tokyo. On less controversial issues, though, we had a pretty day-to-day -day good working relationship with Japan. At the government-to-government -government level, the two, the two governments managed to talk about economic policy coordination, currency issues, you know, recovering your national economy. They actually managed to have a very close co policy cooperation with Seoul uh, on North Korea policy. And then this spring and, and into the summer on the sinking of the Chonan incident, the sinking of the Chonan ship. So in some cases, the alliance performed reasonably well. Crisis 
scenarios like the sinking of the Chonan. Does everybody know the sinking of the Chonan when I refer to it, what it means, right? I'm sure you guys do, right? Um, but the, the Chonan ship, the 48 deaths now of the people that were killed, the naval officers that were killed on the South Korean naval ship Chonan when it was torpedoed by the North Koreans, right? That's the incident I'm referring to. Um, produced a really heightened uh, focus in the U.S. ROK relationship on the United States' commitment to the defense of South Korea, on the U.S.-South Korean commitment to a stable Korean peninsula, and behind the scenes, the Japanese also worked very closely with Seoul and Washington in the United Nations to get condemnation of the sinking of the ship and also to get a fairly unified understanding of what the three allies would do in case another incident arose or in case North Korea took other steps. So in crisis management moments, the Chonan sinking and here with the Senkaku ship, the U.S. and Japan uh, alliance actually worked pretty well. It didn't, despite the political disconnect, it actually managed to perform under stress. The two countries learned their lesson from the last year. I will tell you, when I sit at the Council on Foreign Relations, we talk a lot to the policy teams. They come in, they talk, they, they get expertise from outside government. Um, but there's a certain feeling you get of trauma <laughs> um, from the difficulties of the last year. And the reason for that is the U.S. and Japan have had a very, very close security relationship uh, for a long time, for decades now. And by close, I mean that our uniformed services work side by side, that they operate, especially the navies. So for those of you with the Japan connection, you will know that the U.S. Uh, Navy and the Maritime Self-Defense Forces work uh, almost interchangeably throughout Northeast Asia and even in the Western Pacific. Um, so the uniformed services have a very close relationship. The bureaucracies, the diplomats, the defense civilian planners have very close relationships. But all the, the, that was kind of broken in this last year when the politics changed so significantly. So not only did you have the high-level politics and disconnect between the president and the prime minister, but you also had the government regular consultations being disrupted. And so there's a lot of angst, frustration, concern in Washington about how to get this critical alliance relationship back on track. So the lessons learned, two things, I think. The U.S. has learned to adjust uh, its expectations, that this new ruling party has different expectations, but basically uh, where it matters in crisis management and alliance management, they're working their way back to a, 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 tr a relationship of trust. I think the DPJ on its side, um, it learned very quickly that the U.S.-Japan alliance is absolutely essential to Japan. It looked at the Chonan sinking and the South Korean concern about how to deal with North Korea, and it understood that its security would also, Japan's security would also be affected. But the real eye-opener, the, the wake-up call is the word that people use these days, was the Senkaku, the incident with the Chinese fishing trawler. So the DPJ leadership understands the importance of the alliance to Japan's security. It understands it needs to correct for some of those disconnects that it created last year. So what, what do we have on the agenda, on the policy gen agenda in the months ahead? Um, ironically, it's the economic issues right now. We have a G20 meeting. Does everybody know what the G20 is? Any economists in the room? No? The G20 is the group of 20. It's a group of 20 countries that meet regularly in the wake of the financial crisis. And they talk about financial reg regulation. They talk about currency issues. They talk about how to manage the global financial system better so you won't have the kinds of shocks that we all witnessed a couple of years ago when the economy went, uh, was destabilized. So the G20 this year will be hosted by a Northeast Asian country, by South Korea. President Obama will be there, as will the leaders of most of the other uh, developed countries in the world, as well as uh, Southeast Asian nations, China, of course, uh, India, Brazil, the new emerging economies will all be seated at the table. So Seoul will play host to this meeting, and they will be talking about currency issues, mostly. And we can certainly talk more about this in the discussion. But the real focal point of that is really is China and the concern of the countries about the Chinese currency and whether or not it needs to change value. But again, we can talk more about that. So the high politics of, of, of the relationships in the region are actually very economically focused at the moment. Japan, right after that meeting in, in Seoul, will be APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Committee, which is all about trade policy. 
So President Obama will go from Seoul to Tokyo, and all of the Asian countries will be there to talk about how to get more free trade, how to enhance their economic growth in the region. So those are the two pieces of, of diplomacy in the, in the next month or so that are going to be happening in Asia, and that President Obama and the U.S. policy team are very focused on. Um, I think what you're also going to find coming out of the President's visit to Tokyo is an announcement of a study or a high-level focus task force on the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, the idea is that by the spring, you would want to see for the U.S. and Japan the meetings of the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and that this high-level thinking about what the agenda for the alliance is will, will have to happen pretty fast. So I think the timeline is this spring. You will see what's called a 2 plus 2 meeting, which is the Secretaries of State, Minister Secretary of Defense on our side, and the Minister of Defense of Japan, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And they will craft an agenda for the bilateral alliance. Now, it will be a little bit more than a document, and I'll talk a little bit about what I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to say. Um, the other thing that's on the agenda in the months ahead is the United States, the Department of Defense, is reviewing its global force posture. And for those of you who follow our defense policy, right, there are three pieces that are absolutely important. One is the, what's called the QDR. I'm not sure if you guys are following U.S. defense planning, are you? Does the QDR make any? Nope. Another acronym from Washington, huh? <laughs> I know. You, you don't have to write it down. But the Quadrilineal Defense Review, QDR, right, happens every four years. That's why it's quadrilineal, right, every four years. And it's an exercise in the DOD, in the Department of Defense, that looks at what our strategy ought to be, what our forces ought to be, how to spend money, right? how to recruit people like you, how to devise goals and objectives. Right? So the QDR is one piece. The second is the Nuclear Posture Review. And that is, a, again, a four or five year planning process that looks at what American nuclear posture ought to look like. And that has just happened. The third piece is what's ongoing now in the Defense Department, which is an overview of our force posture globally. So what kind of forces does the U.S. deploy around the world? What kind of scenarios uh, does that deployment, are they based on? And in particular, this force posture review is going to be very important for watching Asia to see what the United States wants to do and what kind of forces it wants to maintain in the Asia Pacific. And nobody is going to define it this way, because it's not right to define it this way. But as you think of where US forces are deployed, you have to think of alliances, right? But you also have to think of a threat environment. And so our DOD is working very hard to think through the way in which the threat environment, particularly in the Asia Pacific, is currently going to be or is being affected by the rise of China. So this force, this force posture review is going to be very significant, I think for revealing our current thinking in our government about how our forces ought to be uh, forward deployed for the next five to ten years. That has an awful lot uh, of attention, that will get an awful lot of attention in Japan. We have 50,000 forces deployed in Japan. Right? Um, and there's a great debate there, of course, about what kinds of forces we need there. In Japan itself, the Japanese are also going through a large thinking exercise about their own strat strategic needs. They have, and I hate to give you another, out, another acronym, but they have a national defense plan that will design the next five years of their defenses and their military posture. And right now, it's very clear that what they want is a bigger navy, a better submarine capability in particular. You, know, you, you may wonder why. Um, greater surveillance capabilities, and you will probably see from this planning exercise the announcement that self-defense forces, Japan's own military now, will be stationed on this island, right, right, right there, <laughs> in the dark, no. on this tiny little island, which is called Yonaguni, and it is the closest, geographically speaking, uh, to Taiwan, uh, but it's also the closest to, to a lot of the naval activity, the maritime activity that goes through the straits and around here. The Japanese are very worried about Chinese submarines. So they're very focused on anti-submarine warfare capability. Uh, they have very strong anti-submarine warfare capability, but now they want to beef up their own submarine uh, fleet. So 
both in Washington and in Tokyo, you're having these large sort of next four or five year kind of planning exercises. What kind of forces will be deployed? What kind of money will be spent? Those exercises are going to be very important, I think, for implementing the strategic vision that the U.S. and Japan need to, to put forward. Politically speaking, we are about to also have an election. And you can't ignore, just because Japan's had political change, you can't ignore our political change. We are about to have a midterm election. Our Congress will change hands, most likely, uh, from a Democrat majority to a Republican majority. It, and the scale of that change is what's being debated in Washington, not the change itself. So you should expect that our politics will become a little bit more difficult. Our policy making will become a little bit more complex. Um, and I think the current administration in Washington is going to have a much harder time trying to implement things that, that difficult policies. I don't think it really matters too much for the U.S.-Japan relationship or for our Asia policy, frankly. And the only place I think it might really matter is in China policy. Um, but I think what you see when you're sitting in Washington is a fairly strong consensus across the aisle between Democrats and Republicans on our relationship both with South Korea and with Japan, on the alliances of Northeast Asia. Where you see difference is in the interpretation of the intentions and the interactions in our policy agenda with China. And so uh, I think that's the one place where you might find that our politics are going to get maybe a little bit more difficult in terms of Asia policy. So let's get back, let's get to the key, which is what ought we to be doing in this re alliance relationship over the longer term. Um, my, my argument is very simple and probably too simple. But I think a lot of what we've done in the U.S.-Japan alliance so far is react. We've had a relationship with Japan during the Cold War for 50 years. It was a pretty stable, pretty predictable world. It wasn't very a very friendly world, necessarily, in Northeast Asia, because you had China, you had North Korea. But it was pretty predictable. And for the Japanese, in particular, it was rather predictable. They were the behind the lines support for the United States forward deployed forces. Right? They had our bases that were in, in Japan were going to be fighting wars if wars occurred. And the Japanese would help support that effort. The self-defense force does not fight abroad, at least not unless Japan is attacked. And of course, in the last 50 years of Japanese history, it has not been attacked. So the Cold War for Japan was a moment to rearm, to help and push forward some of the cooperative efforts that it had with forward deployed US forces, to build more naval capability and air capability in particular. But basically, in terms of strategic planning, the United States strategic planning was the guidelines for Japanese thinking about its own defense. U.S. military was forward deployed. It would be fighting in combat operations. The self-defense forces would be logistically supplying and, of course, defending Japanese territory. There's a little bit of a different world out there now, and I think that's really what the U.S.-Japan conversation needs to be all about. What's, gonna ha what's happening in Northeast Asia, of course, has implications to the rest of the broader e Asia-Pacific. And when I talk about the Asia-Pacific, I'm talking about Honolulu and all the way across, right? What the United States and Japan currently have on the books is a conting contingency planning that only covers the defense of Japanese territory. They have an old plan or an old assumption about the Korean Peninsula. And that old assumption is simply if you had a war between the North and the South, right, the conventional scenario for the Korean Peninsula, then the Japanese would be able to support US forces in certain ways. They have what's called an AXA agreement, so they can serve as airplanes, they can help US forces, they can supply. Um, goods, et cetera. But today, the, co the contingencies and the scenarios that you can imagine emanating from, the, North, from the, the Korean Peninsula are radically different, right? You now have a North Korea that has nuclear capability. Maybe not nuclear weapons in large numbers, but it does have a demonstrated capability to detonate a nuclear device. Our, our strategic planners worry because the North Koreans also are developing missile capability. Um, and that missile capability may or may not be equipped with a nuclear device at some point. Right? So North Korea is, a much more, is much more able to hurt its neighbors, specifically Japan, but ultimately in the long term, perhaps even the United States, as it goes in this direction of missile and nuclear acquisition. Korean Peninsula itself looks increasingly unstable, not necessarily just because of the nuclear issue, but also because of the leadership succession in the North. Kim Jong-il, the leader of North Korea, 
is probably going to be with us for a year or two at most. Right? He apparently has pancreatic cancer. He apparently has at most three years, if, uh, if that. Um, he's just uh, accelerated the leadership transition with his youngest son. How old are you guys? 24? Okay, he's about three, th three, two? <laughs> he's about three or four years older than you guys. Okay. And he will be the leader of North Korea. He is educated, he's been educated in Switzerland. He's you know, I, who knows what he's like as a personality? We don't know. Um, but he has not been in this position of being groomed for taking over in power for very long. But he has very quickly been elevated up. He's just made a four-star general a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so you guys could be four-star admirals, you know, whatever. Um, but that's, that's the scenario. He's the person who is primed to take over that country. So what, you're ex what we're all expecting is when Kim Jong-il goes, the succession is not going to be easy. There'll be competing factions. The military in North Korea may or may not support his designated successor, but you'll have a political situation in Pyongyang that will be a lot more in, unstable than it's been. We don't like the regime in, in Pyongyang, but at least it's a little bit predictable because we've lived with it for a long time, right? But if you have an unpredictable and erratic and potentially divided leadership in Pyongyang, that will make calculating and thinking about the defense of South Korea and Japan much, much more difficult. So that's our first challenge. Uh, and the Jap Japanese and U.S.-Japan alliance is not really prepared to deal with that. The U.S.-South Korean alliance has become much more prepared to deal with that, especially in the wake of the Chonan. And part of what, when I'm talking about preparing, part of what we're talking about is military to military kind of contingency planning exercises. But the big piece of it is the political question of what do we do if? How do we respond if? What do we do separately? And what does the United States and Japan do together? And potentially, what do we do with South Korea? So that's the thinking exercise that needs to happen to think about the future uh, stability in the Korean Peninsula. The second piece, of course, is this broader question of a rising China. And up until September 7th, I think most of us thought that the Korean contingency or the Korean Peninsula issues were much, much more important for, because they were much, much more imminent. You were going to have to think about these much, much sooner. But all of a sudden, we have the Senkaku incident. And we have a two-week interaction between Beijing and Tokyo that makes a lot of the, uh, of the planners in Tokyo, the politicians in Tokyo, very nervous about whether or not they are going to be able to negotiate peacefully problems that they have with Beijing. So let me run through a little bit the Senkaku incident and give you a few dates and sort of the dynamics and, and what, what seemed to be happening at the time. Um, September 7th is when the Chinese fishing trawler uh, ran in to the Coast Guard ship. Tomorrow when you wake up on YouTube or wherever, you will be able to see bits and pieces of that video because the Japanese government today announced it would release it by the end of the day. So all of us will be on our computers tonight or tomorrow morning and we'll be Googling to see what we get to see. Um, it won't be the whole tape. Apparently it's only partially going to be revealed. But what we'll see is the, the, the concrete visual of the Chinese shipping cap, the trawler captain, ramming into a, a, a Japanese Coast Guard ship. Um, what I'm told is on the tape. I could be misled, but what I'm told is on the tape is that instead of when the Coast Guard ship cut, went forward in his path to stop him, to tell him to turn around, is that the Chinese shipping captain accelerated into the Coast Guard ship. And there's clear evidence of acceleration. So two theories. He'd had a little bit too much to drink, one theory. The other is that this was a deliberate act. Third, he panicked. So we don't know what the right answer is in terms of the Chinese uh, captain. But the visual is going to be, apparently, is, is going to be pretty conclusive that he instigated and he responded in a belligerent way. Um, Next morning, uh, the Japanese press announces that he has been arrested and that the Japanese government has decided to try him under domestic law in Japan for obstructing the official duties of the Japanese Coast Guard. It's like if, you're trying to, if somebody's trying to arrest you and you're fighting with the policeman and you say no, you're, you're uh, what's the word, obstructing arrest or 
something like that, yeah, sustain. <laughs> so resisting arrest, that's the word, yeah. So that's, that's what he's being accused of under Japanese law. Um, the next is a Chinese response. So you have a vice foreign minister calling the Japanese ambassador in Beijing, and then it escalates up to the foreign minister, and then by the weekend it gets to be into the state councillor, Dai Bingguo, who is uh, one of the political leaders of China. Um, and very quickly, you know, Dai Bingguo tells the Japanese ambassador, this is not acceptable. Japan has violated Chinese, Chinese sovereignty. You are using domestic laws of a contested international, you know, under international law, contested territory. We don't accept it. We don't, we don't acknowledge that this is a Japanese domestic legal issue. Um, so the Chinese and the Japanese have a dispute over these islands that under international law is still, being un, uh, is still unresolved. So there's claims by both sides. Japan has decided to take this into its own hands and treat it as a domestic legal matter. It's our sovereignty, it's our islands, it has nothing to do with China, right? And diplomatically. And there you have the, the, the difference in the way in which the two countries view the incident. Um, beyond that, you then get to some very difficult dynamics. Now, by the weekend, um, the Japanese government had decided to return the ship and the 14 crew members, not charging them with any crime, just the captain. But at the same time, their legal prosecutor, based in Okinawa down here, said he was going to extend the detention of the Chinese fishing captain in order to prepare the case for court, for trial. So the Chinese reaction to that was vehement, obviously, that that was unacceptable. And you then get into a series of incidents and responses that the Japanese had a very hard time dealing with. You get into the embargo over the export of rare earths. Does anybody know what rare earth is? We all now know what rare earth is because of this incident, right? I mean, it's a, it's a very rare, it's not so rare, but it's, a, it's mined predominantly in China. 97% of the supply is being mined in China. You can find it around the globe, but it's a very messy thing to mine and very nasty thing to mine, so it's polluting, it's nasty, nobody wants to do it. Uh, so the Chinese have a virtual monopoly at the moment on the supply, um, and the Japanese depend on it heavily for, the crea for all kinds of high-tech goods, cell phones, uh, computers, et cetera, et cetera. It's used in a variety of high-tech advanced goods. So the Chinese embar embargo export. Um, at some unknown date, the Chinese also arrested four Japanese corporate um, personnel from Fujita. Ironically, there to help the Chinese, you know, get rid of bombs that were left over from World War II. Um, but these two, these four company uh, officials were arrested, uh, charged with illegally, um, illegally taping military facilities in China. So they were thrown in jail. Um, then you have the Japanese thinking twice and wondering what they ought to do to, to, to tone down the rhetoric. In public, the Japanese government official kept saying this is a domestic legal matter. Uh, we hope the Chinese will be calm. We would like to resolve this peacefully, et cetera. Uh, Wen Xiaobao, Premier of China, uh, goes to New York for the Uni United Nations General Assembly meetings and makes, I think, the most provocative speech, at least that I've ever seen uh, Wen Xiaobao make, and most of the people outside the country, anyway, where he says that, that China will not stop at anything if Japan continues uh, to hold the captain, and he demanded the unconditional release of the shipping captain. Uh, what happens from there is very murky. There's two or three days of high-level meetings, Hillary Clinton, Japanese Foreign Minister, Prime Minister, our President, et cetera, in New York. It's all at the United Nations. And then all of a sudden, one morning, we wake up, and the Japanese deputy prosecutor in Okinawa announces that he's being, the captain is being sent home, that the court case, the indictment is, is suspended w until further notice. In other words, it's not complete, but he's sent home. And all of a sudden in Japan, you hear the government buckled. Japan buckled. Japan caved in to Chinese pressure. The Chinese then made a diplomatic error, or at least a propaganda, a PR error. They said they demanded a, an apology and compensation from the Japanese at which point the Japanese could then gracefully say, I'm sorry, but that's not in the cards, and you know, resolve a little bit of the pride. But it didn't end well for many, from the perspective of many people in Japan. From people in Washington who think about this, they say, well, these kinds of crises never end well. 
one side always looks like it's backing down, no matter how diplomatically you try to resolve it. But the, in the end, you have an incident now where the Chinese now still send ships, fishery patrol vessels, other kinds of ships to the waters that are behind that screen. Um, and the Japanese now are quite worried about their capacity to deal with hundreds and hundreds of Chinese fishing vessels, but also now uh, a larger, obvious, I mean, conspicuously larger Chinese naval presence in the region. Surveillance ships are going back, I mean, air, 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 fl air flights and reconnaissance ships are going back and forth, right, on both sides. The U.S. has clarified its position. It, Secretary Clinton made a very clear statement when she met with the Japanese foreign minister in New York that said, this is disputed territory, but it falls under Japanese administration. Therefore, our bilateral security treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands. It's the first time that a senior U.S. official at that li a cabinet level official has ever made that clear of a statement about the U.S. position on these islands. So the U.S. is committed to defend the Senkakus. They are tiny, <laughs> and they are contested, and the waters in and around them today are full of both Chinese and Japanese uh, ships of all different sizes and configurations. So we have a rather brittle situation in the East China Sea at the moment. I think what most people are trying to do is find diplomatic routes to, think, to put the relationship between Japan and China back on track. But the U.S. and Japan have clearly articulated uh, that they will work together to deal with a China that behaved belligerently, that basically tried to throw its weight around. Um, and today in the news you will have seen that Secretary Clinton and Foreign Minister Maihara agreed that they were going to push for diversification of mining of rare earth materials. So they are going to push globally for a consortium and an international effort to reduce everybody's dependence on Chinese rare earth exports. Um, the diplomatic side with, between Japan and China uh, will be hopefully a little bit better next week. At the end of the month, there will be a high level meeting. We all expect that the diplomacy will resume and hopefully that you'll find the Chinese and Japanese leaders able to put that bilateral political relationship back on track. So diplomacy is a large part of how the two countries are going to deal with the crisis. The U.S.-Japan alliance, however, is going to articulate a pretty clear agenda of how the U.S. And, and Japan can act with South Korea, with other partners in the Asia Pacific, to work on some of the issues that were raised during this, com this, this clash with China. I think the, the in conclusion here, let me just say two things about where the U.S. and Japan, I think, are going to want to take this effort. They really want to focus on the region, on the Asia Pacific. Secretary Clinton, as you may know, was in ASEAN at the ASEAN Regional Forum a month or so ago, where she made a rather provocative statement about U.S. interests in South China Sea, right there where that arrow is. And as you know, Vietnam and the Philippines and Malaysia have all had bilateral uh, difficulties in dealing with Chinese maritime activity. The Vietnamese have had arrests of fish their fishing captains by the Chinese. It's a very tender moment. Uh, there is a lot of territorial claims in that South China Sea as well. So the ASEAN Regional Forum is going to be a place where the region will look at perhaps developing what's called a code of conduct for maritime uh, operations and activities, both naval and civilian, both military and civilian. The hope is right now the ASEAN has what's called a declaration of conduct. Basically everybody says we'll behave well, but what they want is a more legal, formal framework that will govern the kinds of maritime activities that the countries of the Asia Pacific uh, will accept in that area. Mm -hmm. or shoot a, another torpedo at an allied ship. What course of action do you see the United States, Japan's alliance, or South Korea alliance taking, and what have we learned from the, the mm -hmm. Chunnan? Chunnan, yeah. Very good question. Two things. One is if there's another sinking of a South Korean naval vessel, right, or if there's any Pro pro provocation or use of force against the South Korean military, President Lee has already made it very clear that they will respond. So one of the statements that he made, he made a speech on television 
And you know, when they, they, he went the international route, he went the calm, collaborative, let's make sure that we understand what happened here, build support, right? among not only, not only just Washington, but other countries as well. They had the International Commission. They looked at all the evidence on the Chonan sinking. They found the remnants of a North Korean torpedo. Everybody was convinced. Um, after that happened, though, China did not want to have a UN Security Council sanction against North Korea, and instead moved it in the direction of a presidential statement of condemnation. So you don't have the basis of a UN Security Council action. But what you do have is President Lee saying, we now know what happened, and make no mistake about it, the next time the South Koreans are threatened, we will respond. And so, militarily, militarily he, they will use force. Which you also have President Obama backing up President Lee 100%. In fact, some people in Washington have criticized that. But he had, the president, our president, has made it very clear that they, we are in support of South Korea and that we will defend South Korea. We've had naval up. Upper naval exercises in the Yellow Sea, right? Which we don't normally do. We took the George Washington into the Yellow Sea, the aircraft carrier, right? Uh, which made again uh, the Chinese not terribly comfortable or happy. And what that elicited from China was a statement about core interests, which is a code word for the Chinese to say, "Don't don't cross this line, please." <laughs> the, the this is the, the Yellow Sea, in fact, reflected their core interests as well. So you have in that not only U.S.-South Korean amping up of the preparedness or the military uh, preparedness to deal with the North Korean action, but you've also got a certain amount of Chinese concern about what that would look like. Um, for Japan, you had a very strong Japanese diplomatic support in the United Nations. Right? Japan's role in a Korean contingency is still not all that clear. It would support U.S. operations, right? lots of bases, you know. Um, Here's Okinawa down in here. You can't quite see it on this piece, but you, we've got major air bases in and around South Korea, right? So there'd be a lot of logistical support. The self-defense forces would not be engaged at this stage of the planning. Um, but you would probably have maritime ballistic missile defense deployments and things like that in case the North Koreans started to shoot. The spring of 2009, when they tested the missile, they had um, Aegis destroyers, right? Our Aegis, Japanese Aegis and a South Korea, one South Korean. But they were not interlinked. You know, Operationally, they weren't interlinked. Um, but that's the beginning of a ballistic missile cooperative network among those three countries. So that's the kind of thing you'd see, I think, if you saw another missile. If you saw a nuclear attack, frankly, it would be, it would be a fairly quick and decisive US action, I think, to, to end the regime in North Korea. So anything that has nuclear that goes flying out of North Korea, I think, is going to be a a full strike kind of, we have to take the regime out okay. right, kind of scenario. Nobody wants to talk about that kind of thinking. But that's, I think, if you, used, if you cross the nuclear threshold, you'd have a whole different response. Yeah. Uh, my question is, so in these talks with the, the change in the treaties, mm -hmm. uh, I was actually in Japan when the election happened and when the, miss and when the missiles were launched. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me like there was two fads that happened. First, when the, when the, miss when the missiles launched, Japanese people wanted uh, to have more capabilities to attack or to, to make a, to have a response. Mm -hmm. And then when the elections happened, they wanted the treaties more based. They were more worried about Okinawa. Yeah. And the word that they always used with me was uh, colonizing. They would tell me that America was colonizing their country. And so I guess what I'm wondering is what exactly do they want? Do they want more capabilities as in more airplanes and more ships? Do they want more capabilities in their ability to make decisions by themselves, or do they want us to leave their country? <laughs> it's a very good question. <laughs> I think all of the above. I mean, I, I think that's really where the debate in Japan right now is. I don't know that there is one consensus view over what needs to happen. And I think this reflects a little bit the idea that I started out with, which is we're actually in Japan right now facing significantly different scenarios for them and their security than they've ever had to deal with before. Um, North Korea is always weak. It might be threatening, but it was weak. But today it's not, right? China, for the Japanese, was not a direct threat, a military threat. Maybe an economic threat, but not a military threat. Now it's being looked at as potentially that way. Um, so I think what you're seeing inside Japan is, uh-oh, <laughs> we have to change. How we change is not so clear. Um, as you know, the Constitution, Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, prohibits the use of military force 
to settle international disputes. And that's a language that comes out of an international disarmament treaty that was signed in 1928 called the Kellogg-Briand Pact in Europe. But it's a it's treaty language for I won't attack you unless you attack me. So self-defense is okay, but we won't send our armies out to do what we want them to do just to, to, to get our way. Um, the Japanese have a significant military, right? The self-defense force. Uh, did you see any of them when you were there? Did oh, you? Yeah. yeah. I lived right next to a base. For yeah. Them. Yeah. So their navy is uh, second only to the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, and again, if you take the U.S. out of the picture, they have the best navy in Asia. Um, their air forces are also the best in Asia in terms of technology and capability and response time. So if you're if you're sitting over here. The Japanese look an awful lot more armed than you might imagine reading the political debates right, about their military. But what they cannot do is they cannot use military force even to defend us, i.e. the US, somewhere else. Right? So if we're having a fight over here in South Korea, mm -mm. South, they, they're not allowed to do that under the current interpretation of their constitution. There's a huge debate, that missile test last spring. Right? They have a new law that allows their Air Force commander to decide how to respond. But they, if that missile was, was, was hit the United States or hit a U.S. target, they wouldn't be able to respond. You know, so these kinds of in, sort of weird interpretations of what that constitutional prescription really means is, 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 is the big political question for Japan right now. I think it has to break through some of those questions, frankly. Sooner or later, it's gonna, the Japanese military is going to have to respond to a scenario either with alongside U.S. forces or a, in a coalition, for example, in the Gulf of Aden the anti-piracy coalition, they're going to have to use force. And that's going to prompt a, a pretty quick rethinking of that. Um, the bases, is anybody else interested in the base issue? Because I can, let me see if we can find Okinawa real quick. They had a very nice map. That's where you got first. Let's see. Am I going to? That was the other thing. Like, I didn't, I, when I was in Japan, I wasn't in the military or anything, but oh, why is it only sorry. Okinawa? Like, we're, we've got this speckled all over Japan. We do. Um, <laughs> Well, <laughs> let's see. That's the Philippines. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. Can we go down right onto this one? Double click. Perfect. There you have it. All right. A little bit more south. Um, sorry, I'm. I should do it myself, actually. There you go. That's the main island of Okinawa. Um, right now, 40 to 50 percent of that island is US military bases. Right? And that island is 0.03 percent of the total land area of Japan. So the Okinawans basically say to their government in Tokyo, why are all the bases here? Why don't you take more of them up on the main islands of Japan, which, as you know, are vaster and bigger and, and better equipped. Um, part of that is historical accident, right? End of World War II, we invaded, we stayed. Um, and then Okinawa was under our administration, which is why you get the colonization language, right? It was not given back to Japan until 1972. And then we negotiated and it reverted to Japanese sovereignty again. So for the Okinawans, the Okinawans are not anti-American, by the way. If you go to Okinawa, they, they love yeah, Americans, they right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know. <laughs> Taco Bell and you know it's 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 beach territory too so you have to remember there's you know beautiful ocean it's a lovely place um, but the ma majority of the bases here are on privately owned land which is the other piece of the economic pie that actually individuals own the land and they lost all of their property rights pretty much they now get rental payments from the Japanese government but most people in Okinawa would like to see economic development as opposed to having big tracts of base land um, so that's the colonization piece of it, the history, right? Um, and the Okinawans were colonized, of course, by the Japanese. The Okinawans were not originally under Japanese jurisdiction. Um, they used to send tribute to the Chinese, right? They sent, they were a maritime nation. They sent, they sent ships, trading ships, all the way to Viet what's contemporary Vietnam, <laughs> Siam in the old days, uh, hundreds of years before the Japanese even ventured out to China. So. They are a pretty cosmopolitan group of people, very small, but the island kingdom of the Ryukyus is their historical name, had relationships with Asian countries long, long before the Japanese came out of seclusion. Um, so their, their own identity and history is actually quite different from the Japanese as well. <laughs>
the base femma, by the way, which is the base um, that is currently the bone of contention, is in Ginoan City. Um, the population of this small island is 1.3 million people. It's very heavily populated. So you've also got military bases. And, and Kadena is up here, which is where the, it's Air Force Base up here. Ginoan is down here. White Beach is a naval U.S. Navy facility, which is over here. Submarines go in and out a lot from White Beach. Not so populated on this side of the island, but this, this, this is extraordinarily heavily populated island. So you've got major aircraft landing on top of residential areas and cities and schools and things. Yeah? Um, so the neighbors are trying to level something in between. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Here's the thing. Um, that symmetry, I thought, was one of the most positive steps in regional international relations. Um, and as Professor Yu was saying, you know, Japan, South Korea, and China have not had the closest of relations. In fact, they've had fairly bumpy relations, right, because of the history issues, the textbooks, et cetera, right? Korea, too, has a territorial dispute with, with Japan. Um, but the, the symmetry that began in December of 2008 I thought was one of the most promising steps in the kind of repairing of relations, but also the forward-looking diplomacy of those three countries in Northeast Asia. And their agenda went, it began as sort of thinking about economic issues, transborder issues, um, things like, you know, using the same cash cards, right, in all three countries. So if tourists went from one country to the next, they could use similar economic instruments, right? So they had a lot of economic and kind of transboundary issues on their agenda when they started. But by the time they got to the second meeting, right, they were already talking about the Korean Peninsula and North Korea. They were already able to move the conversation, I think, into some of the regional, the region's perception of common and shared interests. And so they have met regularly. Um, they're about to meet next month, I think, and the trade ministers meeting, they have different ministerials, right, so economic trade ministers, et cetera. Apparently, China will not attend the trade ministers meeting this time round. And I think it's because of the rare earth and because of this recent controversy. The South Koreans have taken a pretty hard line as well uh, of criticism against the Chinese because of the Senkaku, beha the behavior during the Senkaku crisis. So I'm hoping that we're going to get over the kind of, diplomatically we'll get over the Senkaku incident in a way that allows for that trilateral part of the regional diplomacy to continue. No, we, our government is, you know, our government used to worry about it because we weren't included, right? <laughs> but now I think there's a pretty strong desire to see that kind of stability in the diplomacy of the three countries. And I don't, I, I just don't know how to tell whether or not the Senkaku incident has really dislodged, you know, that trilateral. Um, but hopefully not, because I think the, the relationship between South Korea, Japan, and China has to be stable and ought to be positive if the region is going to stay. Uh, prosperous and peaceful as well. Yeah. Paul in the back, yeah? Um, the, the Japanese and United States alliance with regard to North Korea seems like a lot of it is being appropriately focused on military action. Mm -hmm. But with regard to China, where military action now is not the one appropriate tool, especially for the Japanese people who are close to China, like with the G20 uh, meetings coming up in Seoul, and obviously for our sake, Mm -hmm. being like a big issue. Yeah. Like what cards does the United States and Japan have to play? Like, does China have to play? Good or question. Or <laughs> yeah. Like, what do we do? Well, I think, you know, this is a debate in Washington, frankly. I mean, there's a, there's a pretty hot debate going on in Washington about whether or not the United States is in a position to really deal st strategically with China. Much of it has to do with the weakness of our economy, this debate, right? Much of it also has to do with Chinese wealth. China has actually come out quite well from the downturn in the global financial, uh, the, the financial crisis and the global economic downturn. China has done quite well. Um, it, the, the, all of this focal point, focus on the currency, and the fixed exchange rate, right, is the argument that China has to make its currency more flexible, more reflective of its economic weight in the, in the global system. Well, you know, that's the argument we used with the Japanese in the 1980s. I don't know if you remember that, because it's probably not. But in the 1980s, Japan was, no, of course not. <laughs> Japan was an economic superpower, and it was rich. 
and it was somewhat threatening at that point to the, to the global economic system. And so the, we had a meeting which was called the Plaza Accord in 1985 and convinced the Japanese to revalue, to allow their currency to, to strengthen, basically, so that their exports wouldn't be so cheap. And that's what happened. Um, I think many people today are looking at China and saying, OK, we ought to do the same thing. So you hear in the G20 a kind of collective pressure on the Chinese to, to revalue their currency. The interesting thing, though, is it's not just coming from Washington or from Tokyo. It's also starting now to come from places like Brazil and India, where the Chinese, again, the distortion on the global economy is affecting the way their financial systems and their assets are valued. So I think you're starting to see the systemic, you know, the whole global system now is being affected by the rise of China, China's wealth, and the way in which the Chinese economy is really the dominant engine, right, of global growth. How you persuade people in Beijing to do something that's really not in their short-term interest um, remains to be seen. So we need to watch. I think in the long-term interests of China, though, getting a better capacity to reflect that wealth in, in global terms will be good for the Chinese citizens down the road. Um, it makes sense down the road. Whether it's going to happen today or tomorrow, we'll have to watch the diplomacy and see. Um, the bigger piece, and there, there's more of that, though, in terms of the Senkaku incident, in terms of your question. Rare earth exports, right? The Chinese economy sucks in the majority of foreign direct investment these days. And globally, it, it probably occupies somewhere around 40% of where most foreign direct investment goes. It goes to China. And so you need alternate sources of good return on your money. So you need other economies to do well as well. And Brazil, India, Vietnam, some of the other Asian countries as well um, are trying to contend with that, to offer opportunities to get some of the action away from China. On rare earth, I think I'm not an expert, but I think it's, it's people are starting to talk about it. it'll take a decade to really begin production, excavation of rare earth. So for the short term, nobody can do anything about it. Negotiate with China. Try to get some continuity. Yeah? Start investing in their businesses. Yep. That's what diplomacy is all about. <laughs> when you don't have military force or power, you negotiate. You persuade, right? So that's what, the, that, that's what you're going to watch people doing. But the move so quickly, I think, to diversify sources of rare earth will, I think, be a, a little bit of a wake-up call to the Chinese, because I don't think they want bad trading relationships with the rest of the world. I don't think that's, that, that there's a lot of people in Beijing who see their relationship with the rest of the world economically as antagonistic. So I, you know, in a sense, it is in Chinese interest to find a middle ground somewhere on some of these issues. Too many hands. And then, I'm sorry, I think you were next, and then we'll come around this way and go back up there again. <laughs> go ahead. Um, because the economy is so bad, mm -hmm. there's a lot of other You mean hours? China just took over many other aspects of the competitive economy. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee Japan uh, moving around? I think it was in 1976 uh, um, agreements about not to export uh, military weapons to other countries. Oh, um, good question. Yeah. They are going to, I think, in this current defense plan that I told you about that was going to be, it's going to be done in by December. But that's not as a result of Chinese economic power. It's because the Jap Japanese companies and Japanese technology can't move freely with the United States um, as we develop new weapon systems and move forward, right? The Japanese are constrained by their non the, the policy not to export, right, military, military goods and technologies. So it's mostly for the investment and mostly to get Japanese technology and private sector technology more actively engaged with the Americans and Europeans, not necessarily because it's going to make them richer with the China, vis a vis the Chinese. Um, but that's the reason for the, the relaxation, and I think it's going to come in this, in this defense plan. Unfortunately, we have time for one more question. <coughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe two more. In North Korea, we just mentioned that Kim Jong Il's gone. I think most of us would like to see a peaceful reunification, but I think the question is whether or not Pyongyang is interested, right? And most people who talk about unification worry about the scenario that I outlined, which is that it's not going to be peaceful, that Pyongyang, in fact, is going to be the beginning of a, of a larger effort, sort of shaking up of the, of the peninsula. Right. Well, e 
No, North Koreans won't want reunification because it won't be on their terms, right? So there's no there's no real incentive there unless you find you know the kind of scenarios that people talk out loud about, but not very often, right? They say, okay, well maybe we can reach out to the next generation leadership. Maybe if the son doesn't work, you know, he, he, maybe there'll be others around him who may want a little bit more opening up or whatever. Right now, though, I think it's pretty clear that the Chinese have invested in the current North Korean regime. I mean, they backed Kim Jong Il, right? Even after the Chonan, right? They they sided pretty clearly with North Korea in terms of reassuring North Korea that they were still there for them. They met his son. They gave more economic aid. They promised long-term economic assistance in the in the economic development plans of North Korea. And they've made it a little harder for South Korea, Tokyo, and Washington to work on issues with the Chinese because now they're, they're much, much more openly supportive of Pyongyang than they've been in the past. So I think as long as the Chinese take that position, maybe we'll get stability. In other words, we'll, but we won't get unification. Right. Can we go one more? One more, yes. Oh, we could take a couple, and then I'll try and answer them all at once. You want to do that? Please. Okay, yeah. very quickly. Some of the questions, um, Sam wrote a paper on the security dilemma with mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. Especially about the uh, TMD uh, theater defense. missile defense. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you do you agree with that stance that um, by us um, having a stronger alliance with Japan that it can cause like increased tensions with China and that perhaps the Japanese won't ever want to continue our bilateral alliance with them? Um, let's get another couple questions and then we'll, I'll answer. Did you have your hand up? No, you're done. You're good. North Korea. Yeah. yeah. Um, security dilemma. I think the, the, the U.S. Japan security alliance has been around for half a century, right? Um, in and around that alliance, you've seen all kinds of different transformations in Northeast Asia, the rise of Chinese power, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that the security dilemma, I mean, basic security dilemma that we strengthen, it makes China strengthen more, absolutely. That dynamic is there everywhere. Um, what I worry a little bit about in terms of the ballistic missile defense is the extent to which it is seen in Japan as a kind of an umbrella that you put up and it'll save Japan from everything. You know, there's a little bit of that kind of thinking as opposed to the arms race kind of security dilemma dynamic. Many people in Japan think, okay, ballistic missile defense means we don't have to think about ever doing anything else other than the ballistic missile defense. And until we get technologically to a place where that system is 100% you know, which it's not, right? Yeah. We're not going to get there. Um, I, it, it's more likely that Japan, Japanese public at least, will think in those terms. I do think, though, that what you want to do is exactly the, be alert to the kind of dynamics with the Soviet, that emerged with the Soviet Union, right? Yeah. You want to be able to communicate with Beijing that this is not, you know, a counter-strike capability. You know, this is not the basis of us having first strike, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be a hard political uh, argument to make for now. North Korea provides the excuse or the incentive for TMD, and I think we, we have a responsibility to keep it focused at the theater level and not expand it in a way that will make Beijing uncomfortable. Even if China's already making voices that they're uncomfortable with the TMD? They've always been uncomfortable with TMD, and they always will be. And what will make them very uncomfortable is if we begin to talk about Taiwan being part of it. Right, and that we should not do. Right, even I would say we we we, we should be very careful about the the Seoul Tokyo Washington piece, and keep it independent, national national systems. Right. Washington is trying to keep it completely. I, I think they ought to. I, I'm not sure that our planners would agree with me, but I think we want to be careful of the political implications of too much integration in Northeast Asia right now. Um, last question. I forgot what it was already. <laughs> North Korea. The, the Chinese are arguing quite strenuously that what they want to do with North Korea is exactly what they did themselves in 78, which is begin slowly to move towards a market opening, much more dynamic economy. We won't call it capitalism, but we're you know, moving it to a better productive capacity. Chinese investment is high. Um, North Korean trade export out via northern China is high. Um, the question is whether or not you think that that regime in Pyongyang is really interested in having its citizens benefit from that system. 
And I think that's the real political question for North Korea. That's in terms of extraction, right? It's a pretty repressive regime, not just in human rights terms, but the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few elites and families, and they all live in Pyongyang. Um, that extractive capacity will continue to be part of what sustains the regime. At some point, if they begin to see that it's in their interest not to have that concentration of wealth, and the rest of the people who live in North Korea share in that enterprise, then I think market opening is exactly the direction that North Korea will go. But they have to make that political judgment, and I don't know that any of us understand that they're ready to do that yet. Does North Korea have rare earth? That's the thing. That's what people are talking about, that they have actually rare earth, right? I think rare earth is not the, the deposit, it's the production. It's the production capability, right? It's the mine. It's a very nasty, messy thing to extract. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Smith. Thank you all very much.